very much. Um, like we've been doing all day, we'll take a full 90 minutes for the panel. And yes, I am joking. Um, the, uh, um, just a couple of words, first of all, what we plan to do with this declaration. Uh, on the one hand, well, we're going to declare. So uh, it will be up on the conference website very, very shortly, uh, well, hopefully within a few minutes. Um, share, retweet, like, and subscribe, I think it goes. Uh, but, but seriously, we hope it's something that you can use to just make a case in whatever you need to make a case. The other thing we're going to do with this, though, is that this is kind of the first set of themes for next year's conference. So we will take these, and what we will try and do for next year's conference is to find people who are actually working on these bullets and tell us how to actually achieve this stuff. That's what we'd like to do. Uh, the point of this panel is to give you uh, a few moments to be able to just uh, badger some of our speakers a little bit longer, uh, but also just to kind of put a little bit of a bow on the event. Um, so uh, it's a simple question to each of you, and the same question. What do you take away from this event as the most important thing? And no, you may not mention your own presentation. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll just, because he's next to me, and I have to get the other microphone, I'll start with Fernando. Thank you. Actually, uh, I see too many recommendations for policymakers. Uh, and something that I would really like to take away, it's like this will be something flexible. We should not really put a lot of walls down in the field. Uh, this is supposed to serve multiple purposes, and if we really want to do that lifelong learning approach, that accessibility and inclusion, we really should not over-regulate what micro-credentials will be about. We should give really the, the opportunity to the institutions to collaborate with employers and not over-regulate from minimum ECTS to a maximum ECTS to fees even. Like if an institution wants to do free waivers for everybody, then it's up to the institution and to its strategy. If they want to, be, to put fees, it's up to their strategy. So we should really be careful on that, and I think that's a key message also for policymakers. I mean, the, I fully agree with the, with the recommendation for policymakers there, but the message from me is do not over-regulate. Let's not become crazy setting up qualification for, uh, quality frameworks, for, uh, European approaches for, for micro-credentials. Let's try to make it as simple as possible that allows us to actually work on what we want to work. Do we have too? Uh, well, it's perfect. So, do we have too many recommendations for policymakers, Mr. Policymaker? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think you can never have enough recommendations, but I think the recommendations are explicit, clear, and needed because ultimately, what we need to do, what this document needs to do, the declaration, is sell the importance of micro-credentials and the need to have them become currency of lifelong learning, be in our funding schemes, be uh, mentioned along other forms of uh, education and training and awards and credentials. We need to talk about it. It needs to be included in every document, EU level, national, by default, just to become one of the elements that are supported and talking about and, and used as a tool for upskilling and reskilling. So there aren't too many recommendations, uh, and it's important that you address the policymakers and I'll play my role and bring this back to the to the commission, but everyone here should also be making sure it's getting to your institutions uh, and you know that you're uh, spreading the word far and wide on 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 what you're doing here. Uh, my takeaway from the event is that the right people are in the room. You got uh, maybe a few more vet and adult education providers, but other than that, we heard from the perfect cross section of people who are going to make uh, micro credentials a reality. And I'm using a word for my, uh, my presentation, kind of putting some structure, finding some logic within the chaos. What I would say your homework for next year is that the people who went upstairs for the trust and quality presentation need to look at all of the presentations that came during the VET and uh, the labor market session and vice versa. Those two uh, sectors or those two perspectives need to come together because this idea of what trust and quality looks like needs to be linked with what the expectations of uh, the labor market and the other uh, recipients, the people recognizing the micro-credentials. So those two worlds need to come together. They're not different perspectives. They need to be the same for the, for the future of micro-credentials. So that was my main takeaway, other than it being a real pleasure to be here and meet everyone. OK, just continue. Um, yeah, I think for me, the first main takeaway is the fact that we need more and more of these kind of meetings, actually, to bring all the different people from different uh, contexts together. 
and discuss things because I think that up until now, at least in Europe, if I may say so, micro-credentials have not released their full potential. The situation we are facing is that uh, countries are different, their educational systems are different, they have different priorities, so whenever we have something big coming up from top, we need to see at the bottom level how it can actually be operationalized. For sure we are missing empirical data, at least said if we're trying to produce as much as evidence as possible towards that respect. We need to be caution, uh, ex exercise caution with this new topic and always reflect whether indeed it is the new black or the emperor's new clothes, actually, which, which was the title of my presentation. I didn't manage to come back to. Are we really talking about something new or is it just an unpacking or, I don't know, been putting the veil on what is already existing? We need to consider these issues. And final second uh, takeaway, this is related to the important voice of the learners. Yes, we are the experts here, but where are they? The, the students that we are teaching and how do they see all these discussions we are having. I think this is an important voice to consider, especially when in Europe we discuss about age-neutral systems, age-neutral vets. That means giving the opportunity to everybody whatsoever to come into education and learn and, and become better in his life. So that's it. Well said, Anastasia. Um, yeah, for me, it's, a, it's carrying on from that. It's that context really matters. And my own context was revealed to me, I think, in, in very stark ways, most recently through a conversation with Mark, where he said, you know, you're, the Ontario environment is extremely competitive. And I said, yeah, right, that's true. Um, and that shapes our approach. You know, that is why we are so focused on market. That's why we are so focused on identifying the exact target audience that we are trying to meet and building to meet the needs of that individual. And to me, that is really what uh, the promise of micro-credentials is and brings, is that ability to, um, to reach out to a different type of learner, a new type of learner, a type of learner that is not currently served by the existing system. Um, and I think that if you, if you meet the needs of those individuals, you also de facto meet the needs of all sorts of other people that may have been struggling in the traditional system. So context really matters, the needs of the learner really matters, and I think that there is huge potential for, for variety within that frame, because you could still say there are, you know, and in, in, in within any, any given country, and then, um, but then also still some, some connectivity mm -hmm. and some uh, overlap between what you're doing and what you're talking about. So finding that balance, navigating that tension, I think is really at the core of what we're trying to do here, but we can really do it better if we get together and understand each other's context. And so that's what really um, was enlightening for me. I was very in, inspired by the fact that most of the research that was shared, uh, particularly uh, around Europe, so I mean, we came together as an international summit, but there is clearly a lot of Europeans here. But the research was that shaped and informed the European policies looked out at what was happening elsewhere. So SUNY was certainly someone that was you know doing this thing early on, Australia, Canada, and I think you know, we should strive to like take those learnings. So we may not have moved first, but if we can learn, you know, better from others, then we should have a bit of a, or make a commitment as a community, as this group to give back and share out with these other regions, because these other regions are looking at Europe now with a lot of, um, <laughs> some are um, fearing that Europe may actually leap over say the US or North America. Um, it's a good tension to have. Um, and so that may help us bring here, make this event more international as in just not European. Um, the other element is that, did we need another declaration? Maybe what we need is to find ourselves like a starting point where we should commit to um, bid toward that, 
those principles. So it's the integrity that we are going to show next year in have we, have we, have we lived out those principles in the declaration. Have we mobilized resources and people to achieve those? So the declaration is really measured on, you know, what is, you know, how do we show integrity as a community to live those principles? Otherwise, it's the same thing that happens with uh, standards. Standards only comes through adoption. Everything else is just specification. So do we want to leave that as a specification, a blueprint, or as a standard that gets adopted? You know, I, I think that that could be an interesting um, tension that we have. Um, and a lot of the challenges that were uh, surfaced, um, I th so we should focus on those challenges, lean into the frictions and the challenges that we've seen, rather than celebrate the, the similarities and the mapping. So there, a mapping exercise is interesting, um, not just to just declare how much aligned we are, but how different we are, and maybe, you know, it's, again, it's that tension that creates flow, eventually. Okay, I have two or three questions I'd love to ask these people, but uh, you came here to listen to them. Anyone want to ask anything? Raise a hand if you're not shy, but then I will ask one or two. I'll start with you, Lena, mainly because of the, uh, what Sigourney was saying, mm. uh, and because you're a token Canadian on the stage. Uh, <laughs> When you go home and be like, I've been two days listening to all these random European initiatives uh, <laughs> and like they do things different in Europe. Uh -huh. uh, what would actually be the thing that strikes you and say, guys, would you believe they do this, if anything at all? Oh, yeah, there's so much. Um, well, I told you earlier, Anthony, that like my whole impression of this is that it's go big or go home. Like you really do do things in a way that is very systematic. And for a uh, more decentralized system, um, SUNY is a, an exception, I should say, right? In like, it, there are some more systems uh, within the US, but in Canada, it's very decentralized. And so, you know, that's a great energy. Like that is very, um, very interesting. And, uh, and it's definitely something that we would want to hook into, right? If we could, because we don't have it. Um, so yeah, I want that wallet, right? I want that wallet for my, for my learners and I don't want to build it myself. So, um, there's lots of really interesting things there. Um, I think from a quality perspective as well, uh, it stands out, you know, this, uh, this focus on quality, the quality conversation and transparency of that element of this work is also something that I'm really taking away and I'm going to apply as soon as I get back because I think in a market-driven environment, you you do tend to, um, if it works, it works, right? And if it doesn't work, you throw it out. But there is, a, there is also a huge value, I think, as a system to us sharing our indicators and sharing our ways of, uh, of, of, assuring value. And so that's something that I'm really excited to give back and to publish from my, uh, my perspective that I'm doing at home in Canada, because, um, I think the more that we do that, uh, the better research we're going to get and the more, uh, alignment we're going to get, uh, to kind of lift all boats. So I'm really interested in the, in those connection points, um, and in leveraging some of those, uh, bigger picture thinking that you do here and bringing it back to my context, which again, like I said, is, is much more competitive, much more, uh, distributed and a little bit more, um, cutthroat in terms of, you know, throwing things out and starting from fresh, a little bit more iterative as well. So I'm, I'm also hoping that maybe we can, we can find a balance between those two things. We can bring some of those practices here to Europe as well. Okay, uh, maybe I'll ask Anastasia a question, completely different one. Different one? Um, uh, <clears throat> there's been a few slides around here throwing around the higher education alternative providers, higher education, labor market credentials, etc. Um, from what you've seen and what you've known, is our future one marketplace of credentials and people taking what they want from various things? Or are we talking about really the emergence of uh, new parallel systems that really lie side by side but don't interact too much? And where should we steer it? Oh, God, that's not an easy question. It requires really elaboration because you touch upon sensitive 
areas, if I may say mm -hmm. so. Um, but instead of replying to that question, I will give you another example <laughs> on purpose. Um, very much inspired uh, from, the hi from history, from the past, because as you know, uh, only when looking back, we are able to look ahead. So when we are asked to talk about the future, I need to really reflect where are we now, or actually how we started to come until here. So in the past, for example, higher education or vocational education and training, general education, really, really distinct spheres, right? Really not talking at all with each other. But we did see with our research, with the future of VET in particular, that there are blurring lines, what we consider initial vocational training, voca continuing training, and also higher education. And we also saw that uh, vocational education training is actually changing and is reaching higher education levels. And this is what we consider academic or vocational drift. We use the specific terms to denote that vocational elements are more influenced by academia and at the same time, higher education institutions are trying to incorporate vocational training as well. So this is the reality now. Now, if we are discussing about the future, whether there will be one marketplace, well, I doubt. I think that we are still a long way to go because different sub the different uh, systems of education are like distinct. They have their own territory. But with research, we see these blurring lines, as I say. I think that really opening up this discussion, being involved, like for instance, we are coming from vet provider, prov provider side, let's say, we should be talking more openly with higher education. Higher education somehow try to protect their territory, and I can understand why. This is perfectly reasonable, this is okay. But we need not to forget how the content and profile of education is really, really changing. How, why, for some reason lately, we are, have this tendency with higher education programs to add more vocational elements. Does that show something? Maybe that the decisions taken so far were not going necessarily to the right direction. I'm just posing questions here, but I think, yeah, we still have a long way to go to have just one marketplace. Okay, wonderful. I'll move it past the microphone to Fernando. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that really struck me about your presentation was just say that you know the things sometimes we think are important are not necessarily the things people always find important. And also, well, you've been trying to implement hyper credentials in a slightly complex context for the last few years. When you look at all these policy documents and declarations and recommendations and so on and so forth, is there any bit of this where you just take one look at it and go, no, that's never going to work? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Uh, but uh, let's say, like, one of the th difficulties we'll fa we face when we started trying to develop something at Alliance level is, like, we are not just a single higher education institution trying to do something. Uh, it's trying to put together nine higher education institutions in a similar approach, uh, but you have to count that they have, even though we might be in Europe with uh, European recommendations and uh, initiatives that are try to harmonize the systems, we have completely different national contexts with different completely new regulations. And the most important thing, the thing that matters a lot, different cultures. We are not so much aware of how much different cultures actually matter in Europe for that matter and the practices at each institution which are not over regulated whatsoever so if they decide we could do it we could do it they matter a lot and that has been a huge difficulty uh, so we decided precisely like okay the, the european approach or some of the recommendations are like great horizons great recommendations great guidelines but if you really try to solve all things at once you will never get there you need to start by tiny steps baby steps sometimes and then keep improving. And that's what we learned uh, from this experience. It's like, okay, let's, we wanted really to use already uh, blockchain technology in using our micro credential. We really wanted to go far, but we realized like if we are really waiting until we reach this far, we will never start. So that's, that will be also something that we learned. Uh, let's start by something and let's, let's keep improving because otherwise we will never reach. And linking to, to the protectionist uh, wall of higher education, I think that we are transcending the, the educational levels with micro-credentials. We should really be able to transcend that because there will be issues where, and that's why it's important to, to link it to qualification frameworks because then it's where it doesn't matter as far as this is linked to a qualification framework. Then w there is much room for collaboration between education levels, between sectors, and it's where we will be able to transcend these, I would say, mental barriers because they are not real barriers at the end of the world.
One question for Simona. You're very much, uh, let's say, at the nexus between digital, micro-credentialing, etc. So when you look at it, are digital technologies driving the micro-credential revolution or are micro-credentials helping drive the digital transformation? So there are you know, kind of one, two parts of the same thing. So imagine like a yin yang thing or um, some people think about them as two complement complementary opposites. Okay. I think you know credential could digital credentials could be a great vector to support portability and you know, security, some you know, marginal aspects, marginal in respect to the learning. You know, to the semantics, to the sense making, to what they're you know what they what they are meant to me, um, but they go hand in hand, and I think they um, it's already I'm already in my angle into this is what is the adoption of credentialing technologies or recognition technologies sometimes I call them. I think open badges, for example, that has been around for a while, has uh, just really benefited from. Uh, micro credentials entering the stage, and so there's been a skyrocketing of adoption of these uh, interesting um, credentialing technologies because, because at this point it is a technology that is mature, it's widely adopted, it's easy to use, it's production ready, as we would say, and so a lot of the initial micro credentialing programs have been certified or recognized using open badges. Okay, open badges are becoming verifiable credentials, so there's a technology roadmap. You know, it's a journey. It's never like you know, blockchain today and something else tomorrow. It depends on on where you are, and you should be able to engage with this transformation. So, uh, micro credentials have you know, looking back in history, maybe I would put them as kind of in the renaissance of learning. I think they've been uh, tearing down the walls between formal and informal education. Um, I think academia is probably. Uh, as rebranded MOOCs as micro credentials, so they could not admit that they were wrong in pushing back. <laughs> um, but that's all right. I think you know that kind of renaissance is, is being supported by new technologies that make uh, these things you know way more portable, way more uh, way more supportive for mobility, which is not just learning mobility; it's you know workers' mobility. So I do think that they may feel like there are two different things because one is learning and the other one is technology, complementary opposites again. But they are still just one of you know of the whole. Okay, uh, my last question, and it's a I'd like to issue a challenge to the whole panel, and whichever one of you wants to be brave enough to try it, go ahead. We've all been talking about the importance of kiss, of communicating our message effectively. So my challenge to anyone who wants to try it: Can you please explain why micro credentials are important to an eight-year-old? <laughs> Who would like to give it a shot? <laughs> Simone is giving the first try. <laughs> um, everything that you do online, playing, should be recognized and part of you know your identity and be able to make up you know a, a, a much more finer grained picture of yourself over time. So if you start collecting those um, tokens or data points about yourself, whatever you do. Uh, I think that would be an interesting tool for self-reflection, but also it could uncover or make the invisible manifest, like part of your identity that is not easy to to represent. And now you may have something to um, to show for. And these are experiences, small or micro learning experiences that may often be important for you, but they may also be relevant to others that are trying to assess you and figure out who you are. Uh, just saying, your eight-year-old is remarkably. Uh, <laughs> I see Anastasia has a try. My son is twelve years old, not eight years old. But okay. As soon as you asked this question, immediately he came into my mind, uh, my dear Philippos. So what he likes a lot doing, and other kids of his age, to play these weird video games. To be honest, sometimes at the weekend. And once I, I secretly saw what he was doing, it was a kind of a violent game. You know, this is now the new fashion. So they try somehow to survive in an online world, let's say, and they, without realizing they are having specific skills and competencies in order to do that. So if I would have Philippos in front of me, I would definitely not talk about skills and micro-credentials. You'd say this is Chinese to me, or even Greek, for other nationalities. Uh, I would say, okay, Philippe, how did you manage to win? What did you do? How did you really... Um, 
you know, made it there. And he would say, well, uh, I try to take a good, I don't know, sometimes they even use um, some weird equipment. I use that uh, thing in order to go to that level. So he would try and justify the way he managed to reach from one level to another, but without realizing, uh, of course, how he did it. So the idea is not to talk with the term micro-credential, that would be my message, but rather to focus on what is hidden behind, what are the um, hidden or not necessarily conscious skills you, you would need to have in order to go from one level to another. Okay, the whole panel is trying, wonderful. Uh, I don't know anything about children, except they love snacks. <laughs> And one of the terms I've heard most, uh, one of the terms to describe and the metaphors I've seen floating around are learning snacks, learning bites, tastes of learning. Uh, and we want to encourage curiosity. Eight-year-olds are curious, they're still learning, they're asking questions. So let's encourage their curiosity, build their curiosity and show them that it's good to get answers and understand things and give them a snack at the end, which is their micro-credential. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I will not go to the food one, but uh, I, I was actually thinking since the very beginning, since you mentioned, maybe because I, I'm also like from the 80s, a treasure hunt. This is, this is a treasure hunt. This is really going through different, steps, through different stages, getting stamps in your passport, where different people will be able to understand what you achieved, what you got, and that may be also something at the end of the day, so that, also that idea of stackability. And being lost in the way and going back and then, then Fourth again, uh, so this kind of idea of a treasure hunt is something that I will play with, with if I will have any kid. <laughs> so I want to give it a shot myself, if you don't mind, because now I feel it's unfair. Um, uh, I think what I'd tell my kid would just be, remember that a lesson you didn't understand today at school. I want you to live in a world where you can come home, open up your tablet, and relearn it any way you want. Simple as that. Anyway, a great... Round of applause for our panel.